attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, and this webinar is being uh, co-sponsored by Open Channels. Um, and Nick Wainer is also uh, acting as a co-organizer, so you may hear from Nick at some point. Um, but we're very pleased to welcome here today Healy Hamilton and Shumei Han of NatureSurf, who are going to be um, talking about the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you guys know a couple of things, um, namely how to ask questions. So uh, we we're we going to have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. We have about 15 to 20 minutes set aside, and um, so really substantive questions, let's, um, we'll ask them at the end. Um, there's two ways you can submit your questions. You can type them into the question panel of your user interface, and then I can relay them to Healy and Shume. Um, and we encourage you to do this throughout the webinar. We'll just hold most of them till the end. Um, but you can send them in any time so you don't forget them, and so we have them. So that would be great. Uh, you can also raise your virtual hand. It's a little hand icon in the user interface. You can raise that virtual hand, and we can unmute you. And uh, you can ask the question directly to the presenters. Um, this only works if you have a working microphone or if you've called in, if you've entered your PIN number. So um, if you do want to ask a question directly to them, make sure you uh, have a working microphone set up, um, or you've entered the PIN number if you're using the phone. So anyway, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're really glad you're here today, and I'm going to turn it over to Healy and Shumei now for the presentation. Hi, Sarah and Nick, and uh, to all of you who are online. This is Healy Hamilton. I'm chief scientist at NatureServe, and I am a company. Healy, you there? Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I think it might have been Sarah's connection again. Okay, all right. So I'll start over. I apologize. Uh, thank you very much to Sarah and to Nick for hosting the webinar today. Uh, my name is Healy Hamilton. I'm Chief Scientist of NatureServe, and I'm joined by Dr. Jumei Han, our Biodiversity Indicator Specialist here at NatureServe. And we're here to discuss a uh, a tool for helping to uh, analyze, visualize, and disseminate indicators about biodiversity that help us measure how we are doing in, our, in the challenges that we face towards accomplishing our conservation outcomes. Uh, and the name of that tool at this point is called the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard. What I'd like to do today, since many of the um, people who are online at the moment may not know who NatureServe is and what we do, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to NatureServe as an organization, but it'll be quite brief. And then I want to provide an overview of the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard as it now stands. We are ending, uh, in the next month, a three-year grant for prototyping the dashboard. So we're looking to then talk about the future directions that we want to take the dashboard in. And then I'd like to go into two examples uh, as far as applications that can be supported by the dashboard to try to demonstrate the, the real-world applications of the tool that we've constructed so far. And so for one of those, we'll be talking about uh, the the constant problem of data gaps and, and how we can use the dashboard to look at uh, how we might fill in national data gaps from disaggregating global data sets. And then look to an example in the country of Cambodia, zooming into the Eastern Plains, an area of high biodiversity value, and talk about how the dashboard assisted a preliminary counterfactual assessment of the effectiveness of uh, the conservation investment made by a consortium of foundations. So briefly, I, I just want to communicate a, a little bit about NatureServe and who we are and what we do, since, since many people might not be familiar with us. First and foremost, NatureServe is a network, and the uh, countries that are highlighted in green here are countries where NatureServe has an affiliate member program, uh, programs that we have actual data sharing agreements with. In all the 50 states of the United States, those programs are called natural heritage programs. And in Canada and Latin America, they're called conservation data centers. And so these are biodiversity information centers that are tracking information about biodiversity on the ground. And then NatureServe 
based in Arlington, D.C., and with a few regional offices, is responsible for um, sort of rolling up that information, uh, making sure that it, it can communicate with all of the different programs, and deploying that information to support the science behind effective conservation actions. We assess species, so we, we try to rank them so we can understand what the conservation status of species are. We um, use our in-situ observations together with remotely sensed information and other modeling aspects, and we try to map ecosystems. And even though our network of biodiversity information centers is focused in the Americas, we have project areas that are, um, are global right now. So in the bottom graphic, you're seeing uh, areas where we have done vegetation maps in the light green and areas where we have um, projects in the yellow in addition to the biodiversity information center distribution in, in the white. Uh, collectively, we field about six million requests a year for biodiversity information. We've built quite a few different online tools. We have mapped specific localities of at least a million at-risk species, and, and that is our biodiversity information focus, is the, the rare, the threatened, the endemic, the unique species. Uh, and importantly, we, are, we don't have lobbyists, we don't have lawyers, we are a non-advocacy organization that um, wants people to make decisions with the best available biodiversity information, but we don't tell people what information, what decision to, to make. Uh, the key questions that we focus on are the very fundamental questions about biodiversity. What exists? What is its status? What are its distributions? And what are the actions that we can do to ensure that it sustains uh, into the future? And this is just one example of what we, what we have done. This is a conservation status assessment for North American species that is divided by major taxonomic groups. So uh, we focus not just on the vertebrates and the flowering plants, but we look at a bunch of invertebrates as well. Um, and then you're looking here, the proportion of these taxonomic groups that are in different categories of imperilment from vulnerable to presumably extinct. Uh, and so this is sort of a, a very updated uh, just from April 2015, collectively the information across our network, what does it tell us about uh, the proportion of North American species that are uh, at what st state of risk? Uh, we are the IUCN Red List Authority for North America, so we um, partner with IUCN to really understand global and national patterns. Uh, and finally, we, we publish a lot of reports, both in the scientific literature and, uh, and a lot of um, sort of gray literature reports focusing on everything from vegetation maps to climate change vulnerability assessment tools uh, to conservation status assessments. So I just wanted to provide people with a little bit of background of who NatureServe is um, before launching into uh, the discussion of the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard so that uh, our audience had a little bit better understanding of who we are and what we do and why we uh, undertook uh, the effort to put together this tool. So dashboards as a concept are becoming increasingly popular and for very good reason. I mean, we all recognize that there is so much more data out there than there is uh, information that has been translated into a knowledge product that has been useful to support a decision. So how do we take the vast amounts of data that we are accumulating, and of course that the rate and magnitude of data accumulation is only increasing, and how do we, excuse me, <coughs> Sorry, how do we quickly convey essential information for decision support? So these are not <coughs> sorry, these are not um, biodiversity dashboards. These are these are dashboards that are coming from <coughs> other fields. But the idea is clear that we're trying to consume information <coughs> and turn it into something that can be quickly visualized in an intuitive way uh, so that we can communicate to decision makers where are we, what's happening, what's the rate of change. Uh, and so the, the concept of dashboards is increasingly popular uh, more, more and more. So the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard has been assembled as a way to specifically try to map, uh, to, to try to communicate 
progress towards reaching the targets that the com environmental community has set for biodiversity. And the primary set of targets is the Aichi biodiversity targets that we are aiming for as a global community to reach by the year 2020. And so uh, the dashboard is supposed to uh, help us to see in a spatially explicit context uh, indicators that we have around these 20 Aichi targets. Uh, and of course, we don't have indicators for all 20 targets. And some of these targets are, not, are, are more socioeconomic and a little bit less biological. So here on the screen, if you can see the targets that are uh, richer in color versus the targets that are a little bit more pale, for the targets that are richer in color, those are ones that you can click on that, on that button, and it will actually take you to a map, a, a spatially explicit uh, map of how that in, of that particular indicator. So that's one way to get into the dashboard. Um, so I want to take you on a tour of just a few different example sort of screenshots from the dashboard. It is live and online, but for the sake of time and sometimes the, the data loading time, I'm just going to walk you through some screenshots right now. So if you were to click on Explore Indicators um, or on any of these uh, lit up Aichi targets, it would take you to an interactive web map. And so this web map is focused on analyzing and visualizing time series data sets on the status and trend of biodiversity. So uh, currently, because we are at the end of a three-year prototype phase, we are, uh, we've been funded by the MacArthur Foundation, and the, the dashboard is currently enabled just for three geographic areas that you see here that are the geographic focus of MacArthur Foundation long-term investment portfolios. So that's the tropical Andes, the Great Lakes region of East Africa, and the lower Mekong Delta. Uh, uh, so the idea here is to visualize multiple indicators at multiple spatial scales. And this, this aspect is very important because different users have different spatial scales at which they want to understand the status and trends of biodiversity. So we've built the platform to be flexible enough that you can look uh, right now at, at the scale of those three regions compared to one another. You can look at the scale of an individual nation or nations compared to one another. We've also, uh, t t for indicators that can be disaggregated to a watershed scale. We can compare across watersheds. And then we have a fourth most spatially uh, fine resolution uh, scale, which is the site scale, which generally is protected areas or key biodiversity areas. So it's quite a flexible platform. It's highly interactive. And, it can, and the indicators, to the extent which the data support it, can be deployed at multiple spatial scales, depending on the, the user. The, the user gets to choose what scale of interest they have. So what we want to do is help communicate progress towards major conservation targets, such as National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans, or the Aichi targets, or the Convention on Migratory Species. There are a whole bunch of multilateral environmental agreements that many countries have um, signed up for. And we really want to provide a tool that at least supports, it, it can't take you all the way there, but it can support the evaluation of the very important question, are the conservation investments that we are making being effective? So we can uh, you know, look across uh, different spatial scales at biodiversity indicators. And uh, to the extent that we understand what conservation investments have been made in a certain area, we can see what the status and trends are in the regions that have received or not received those investments and support some comparison. It follows, so the, the biodiversity indicators dashboard follows this conceptual framework that has been widely acknowledged and, and sort of accepted in the literature for indicators, and that is the pressure state benefit response model. And so we want to support the work that has already been done and the, the sort of the framework that the indicator community has already gotten behind. Uh, and so all of our indicators are. Um, are categorized as one of these four uh, conceptual framework types. So here's an example of an indicator uh, at the watershed scale. 
here we are in the um, countries that touch upon the lower Mekong River Basin in Southeast Asia. And we're looking at a pressure indicator, which is the annual loss of forest cover. So I'm sure most of you who are on the webinar are well aware of the extraordinary work of Dr. Matt Hansen from University of Maryland, who has uh, generated a time series of forest loss for the entire globe at very fine spatial resolution. And so what we were able to do is we acquired the annual data from Dr. Hansen's lab, and, in, and then we were able to create a year-by-year -year rate of loss so that we had a time series trend of the annual loss of forest cover. This indicator allows you to, you can click on any of the watersheds and up will come this graph that you see on the right that will tell you what the forest cover was at the start point, what it was at the end point, what the rate of change is, and we'll give you a graph. Uh, and so this is one, one way where you can see that, uh, so, so these data have been aggregated by watershed, and you can quickly see what the rate of forest loss over this 12-year period is per watershed in this region. Here is a pressure, an example of a pressure indicator. We're looking here at the tropical Andes, again at the watershed scale. This is a landscape condition model that is a NatureServe product that was generated in support of the Red List of Ecosystems project for the Americas. So one criterion in red listing ecosystems is the condition of the landscape. This is essentially our version of a human footprint index. And so we're looking across different watersheds at what is the condition of the landscape for this um, assessment that was done in support of a, of a different project. Therefore, we only have this indicator for the tropical Andes of those three different regions. But there are other uh, indices, sort of footprint indices that are out there that are global, as we'll see a little bit later in the presentation. And again, you could click on any of these watersheds, and up would come a graph, and you'd get a little bit more uh, detailed information about that particular watershed. Here's one zooming out, looking across MacArthur's three geographic regions of conservation investment. And here we're taking uh, a state indicator. We're asking for uh, vertebrate species that have multiple uh, assessments of the red list. Can we look at what the annual change, here it is across all species. So the extent to which more species are added to the red list over time, that would allow you to understand what is the annual change over time from the first assessment to the last assessment in the addition of species to the red list. And so you can quickly see here that the tropical Andes are experiencing the greatest increase in numbers of species that are added to the red list in comparison, comparing these three regions. And then clicking on that, you can have it's broken down into all species, the blue line, uh, and then the red line at the top is birds, the yellow line is mammals, so you can see that each has at least two assessment points, and you can instantly see here that it's really the rate of amphibian decline, the green line at the bottom, and the one that has the steepest slope, that is driving that uh, issue of in increasing uh, annual change in, in the red list index in the tropical Andes. Here is a benefit indicator. We've used Dr. Sasan Sachi's global data set on the potential for carbon sequestration and aggregated that again to the watershed scale. And so this, this particular data set is not yet in a time series format, so we're just reporting on a, a particular a sort of a one, to, one point time step. But you can see quickly what is the potential of each watershed relative to one another in this Southeast Asian region for sequestering carbon if deforestation were avoided. Uh, and then finally, an example of a response indicator. This is an analysis that came from collaboration with BirdLife International, where they asked the question, to what extent do protected areas cover key biodiversity areas? So when a country is establishing new protected areas, are they, are they putting those new protected areas in places that the conservation community has stated are highly valuable for biodiversity? And we're looking at the watershed scale to see, over time, which watersheds have the highest rate of protected area coverage over key biodiversity areas. And you can see there's quite a bit of spatial variation, and some watersheds have 
a much higher rate of covering KBAs than, than others. Currently, there's 18 indicators that are in the dashboard. There, all of these are not available for all regions. Some of them are uh, region specific, uh, but this is where we're heading. It's very easy, it's much easier to find pressure indicators than it is to find benefit indicators. So to those of you who are actively uh, involved in trying to generate indicators, we, we really need more indicators of the benefits of biodiversity to human well-being, ecosystem services type indicators. So much easier to find those that cover the, the pressure or the state than it is for those to, to describe the benefits of biodiversity. All of the indicators that are published in the dashboard have detailed metadata associated with them, and that that metadata is laid out in a in a pretty simplistic way, just sort of a, sort of a Q and A, aimed at the most general audience. But the last answer to the last question here always connects you to the organization from which the data originated, and um, often the the original publication uh, that was behind where the indicator came from. And I mean, this is a, a really important point to state that you know, the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard is a visualization and dissemination tool where we are adding some analytical support to data sets that have already been published. So there is no Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard without the collaboration of the organizations that have produced these indicators in the first place. And in, in that sense, we're simply trying to provide more of a visual voice, if you will, a visual megaphone to spread the work of others and turn it into something that can be quickly and intuitively understood. Uh, and so um, this, is, this is a very collaborative project, as, and I'll show some more uh, uh, acronyms and logos at the end. Uh, here's one example of that collaboration. Um, IUCN, BirdLife International, World Conservation Monitoring Center, Conservation International, all of these, University of Maryland, all of these were co-authors on an initial publication that came out about the dashboard that included some of the methods, uh, primarily led by Jimei Han in generating those first set of indicators, so published last year in PLOS 1 uh, and is open access. So I want to move quickly to talk about some future directions for the dashboard. As I mentioned, it is enabled right now for these three high biodiversity value regions. The dashboard was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, and these are the three areas where the MacArthur Foundation, uh, in collaboration with several other foundations, has long-term investment portfolios. And so the MacArthur Foundation has been using the dashboard themselves to support understanding the context and trends in the conservation investments that they're making. However, if the dashboard is really going to serve the global community, I mean, it can't remain focused just on these three regions. To, to really have um, much more value, it needs to go global. And MacArthur recognizes that. I mean, initially, I would say there was a little bit of a tension, like, what is, who is the audience for the dashboard? What is it serving? And MacArthur has recognized the value that it has to the greater community, and so our first future direction is to take the dashboard global. So as I mentioned, we're at the end next month of a three-year prototyping phase. That prototype is complete and has exceeded all of the original goals set out in, in the current um, project scope. And we now have a proposal in front of MacArthur to try to take the dashboard to the next phase, um, which would be full implementation. And so the, one of the first places we want to go is to populate the dashboard with some global indicators. Um, this is the 2005 Human Footprint Index uh, com that came from Wildlife Conservation Society in collaboration with Columbia University. And so I, I think it's important to recognize that most, many of the indicators that are currently in the dashboard and populating data for the three MacArthur regions are actually global data sets that Jimei has worked to sort of disaggregate at different spatial scales within MacArthur's three regions. So it will be quite, uh, we're, we're very well poised to turn many of those globally disaggregated indicators into actual global indicators and populate the dashboard with a set of global indicators very quickly if we are successful in securing the next round of funding. 
Here's another example of uh, a global indicator, certainly at larger spatial scale than the MacArthur regions. So now we're looking at Sasan Sachi's carbon sequestration potential. We're looking at it at the national scale. Um, and this was done sort of for a band of for tropical forests. So there are regions where there aren't data, but for the regions where there are data, you can quickly see at the national scale, um, you're able to compare sort of that potential for carbon sequestration country by country very, very quickly and intuitively. So we want to take many of the indicators that we currently have that we're only visualizing in those three MacArthur regions and offer them at the different spatial scales that are appropriate for that indicator um, with a global, with a view to the global capacity. We recognize that there is as much a need for indicators in the marine community as there are indicators in the terrestrial community. This is just a mock-up of the Reef at Risks Threat Index. Um, and so we're really just visualizing what could a marine indicator look like in the dashboard. And so uh, this is what it could look like. There's a lot of activity, in the, especially in the coral reef community right now. Um, to try to come up with indicators, not just for the condition of the biological resources, but socioeconomic indicators for how communities are dependent upon coral reef resources. And so we hope that the dashboard will be able to serve, again, as that sort of visual mouthpiece for results that are coming from the millions of dollars of investment that's going into coral reef monitoring and the monitoring of the health of the well-being of the communities that depend on those reefs. So we hope to be able to collaborate with the, um, the marine community in the indicator data that they're generating and offer a venue for the dissemination of that information. We're very excited about the concept of being able to take the dashboard to the level of individual nations and offer portals for a country. Now, there's a lot of reasons why looking at a country-based dashboard makes a, makes a lot of sense. I mean, it is countries that whose governments have signed up to be uh, committed to a particular multilateral environmental agreement, you know, whether it's the Convention on Migratory Species or whether it's CITES or whether it's the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's countries and their governments who are making that, take, sort of taking that stand and have an incentive to report on how they are doing towards reaching those goals. It's also possible with country indicators to get to finer spatial scale data. Uh, so here uh, is uh, an intersection of looking at the loss of forest cover and we've highlighted where the key biodiversity areas are in Cambodia relative to loss of forest cover. So you can get to finer spatial scales, you can get to national data sets that wouldn't be available for a region uh, and, and support governments in trying to produce and visualize information that they are uh, to help demonstrate the rate at which uh, they're being successful in meeting their multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, so uh, it also, you, you can sort of dig in deeper and get a little bit more context about things like land ownership. So for, we're, we're demonstrating a, a Cambodia national portal, which is uh, the first one that we have, have built uh, to demonstrate what a national portal might look like. And you can get layers like, you know, who is it that is um, responsible for the management of a particular area. So here we have community-based fisheries areas that are designated, community-based forestry areas that are designated, and then which ones are National Forest Administration or National Ministry of Environment, and who the landowners are, you know, once you intersect something like that with, say, rate of forest disappearance, you can get a much better understanding of what is the effect of um, the of who is managing that land on some of the indicators uh, that we have populated at a national dashboard scale. We want to make country landing pages much more dashboardy. So our next country dashboard we're developing in collaboration with the Instituto von Humboldt in the country of Colombia. And so um, this is just one of three consecutive screenshots that uh, this is a, a live online dashboard, and if we have time, we can go back and, and take a look at it. But um, so if you scroll down the live page, you'll see the equivalent of what these next three 
screenshots demonstrate. But so here we just wanted to convey how is this country doing with respect to reaching the Aichi targets of terrestrial and marine land protection. So you can very quickly see here that Colombia has well has already exceeded the Aichi target of how much land it wants to, to protect. It's exceeded the global average and that in general um, Latin America and the Caribbean has exceeded the Aichi target for land protection. And then looking at the marine, they're very close to the marine target. They are above the global average for the marine target. And so just trying to, to convey things that are extremely dashboard, in, in a way that's much more dashboardy than we've accomplished with the global dashboard so far. And then scrolling down on that same page, same landing page, we want to quickly convey, well, what is the richness of major vertebrate groups there and what extent of that richness is threatened? So here we have um, the number of species globally and nationally for these three major vertebrate groups. Uh, which of those species, what's the percentage of those species that are endemic and what's the percentage of the endemics that are threatened. And so, I mean, you can quickly see here that Colombia is uh, extremely important, important for, for birds and that it has incredibly high endemic bird diversity and of those endemic birds, m more than half of them are threatened. Uh, so really wanting to convey information about species endemism and species threat and species richness in a very quick and intuitive way. And then finally, we're go we want to add a little bit of information about ecosystem types. And so this is mocked up right now, and uh, the Mesoamerican forest is not as relevant to Colombia. Um, we're, we're still working on mocking this up. Uh, but because, again, of that Red List of Ecosystems project that we contributed to, we have mapped the current extent of all of the macro groups, a, a vegetation classification scale, uh, and, and so we're able to show what the distribution of macro groups is, what the percentage of each macro group that covers Columbia, and this will be an interactive clickable map where you can click on some of these squares, which are different types of tropical forest, different types of wetlands, and you'll get a pop-down menu with a map of the distribution of that type, a photo and a little bit of information about it. So we really think this is going to uh, convey m a lot about what are the ecosystems that comprise a particular country in a, in a quick intuitive way um, that we hope people will really be able to appreciate much more the ecosystem diversity uh, in each country. And then we have so far just a couple of socioeconomic indicators, but we plan to expand this list of indicators on country landing pages. So here's a, just a quick snapshot of World Bank data, right? We have per capita gross domestic product and per capita CO2 emissions. And you can see that the GDP is increasing while the CO2 emissions per capita are staying pretty flat. That's a success story that can be very quickly conveyed in, um, by just putting a, a couple of different uh, graphics here that are socioeconomic indices. We want to add the um, global footprint network index per country or per capita and a um, also possibly World Resources Institute has an environmental democracy index. So we're open to adding other country indices. And in our next round of the dashboard project, we want to, we, we've committed to standing up 50 national dashboards that would be initially populated by that globally disaggregated data. Uh, and so we have some uh, interest from a suite of countries on next steps and then we're, we're very open to partnerships with people that have country-based indicator data that we would be able to populate um, in trying to reach our commitment to standing up 50 national dashboards. So quickly I want to move on to just a couple of examples that are supported by the dashboard. Um, so I want to talk about this issue of data gaps and how the dashboard can, and the, the ability to, or the fact that it's populated with indicators that have come from global data that have been disaggregated at the national scale can help us to fill in data gaps at the national scale. So here we're going to move to the tropical Andes and this is work that, um, that Jimei Han has done with some other colleagues here at NatureServe. And essentially, we, between these five tropical Andean countries of Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, we have generated 
both, we've, we've looked at are there nationally reported data sets for each of four indicators, and then we've generated the globally disaggregated data set at the national scale, and we're doing a comparison of these two, data, these two individual data, data types. So, for example, in comparing forest cover loss metrics between the globally disaggregated data and those nations who report the forest cover loss values, we have a data gap in Venezuela. Venezuela doesn't have a nationally reported value for forest cover loss. But for the other four countries, we can compare uh, the globally disaggregated data value with the nationally reported data value. And so the disaggregated data value from the global data set is in black on the left for each country, and the nationally reported value is on the right. And so you can see that there's pretty general agreement across uh, the countries about what the two values are. They're not wildly different. In Peru, they're, they're the closest of all. There's also no clear trend in whether it's the global disaggregated data set that has a higher rate versus the nationally reported data set that has a higher rate. But certainly, this would be very interesting to people in Colombia and Ecuador who want to be looking at the rate of forest loss because they're reporting a higher forest a higher loss of forest cover than the globally disaggregated data is. But this also points to the importance of having standardized terminology. What is a forest? You know, the globally disaggregated data set has a threshold at which it's calling forest, and below that threshold of, you know, percent forest cover um, in any given unit of area, it may not be reporting, whereas Colombia and Ecuador may be looking at a, a different threshold. So this points to the importance of having um, communication around our methodologies where we're very clear about you know, what is a forest and what's the threshold for reporting forest cover loss. And possibly we can, we can look to this and at least say you know, it's like th that the Venezuela data gap, um, you know, it's likely to be somewhere around 20%. I mean, given the trends in the other four countries uh, that we have some general uh, approach for looking at what that value might be for Venezuela. Looking at IUCN red list metrics, so these are data sets that we have at the global scale for global assessments, and then many countries undertake national red list assessments as well. And so, uh, for example, for the country of Bolivia, we have both global assessments for birds, mammals, and amphibians and Bolivia has undertaken their own national red list for vertebrates. And if we look at the birds, mammals, and amphibians in that one, we have very close agreement between the globally disaggregated IUCN red list metrics and the nationally reported metrics. So for the country of Peru, there is no data on birds, mammals, and amphibians. Peru has undertaken a national red list effort, but it's just for endemic plants. And so we can look at, not, at the globally disaggregated data, and given the, um, the agreement between those two different approaches for Bolivia, we're, we can say that you know, probably for Peru, these globally disaggregated metrics get us pretty close to what the national reported value might be. In Ecuador, the only red list that has happened is the mammals, and so again, we don't have a national red list for birds or amphibians, but we probably can use the globally disaggregated data set to potentially fill in those data gaps. Uh, a, a protected area metric, um, looking between the globally disaggregated and nationally reported values. Uh, so here, this again is the rate at which new protected areas that are established cover key biodiversity areas. So in Venezuela, that rate is very high. The, the, so the rate of uh, increase of protected areas covering KBAs over time is quite high in Venezuela. In Peru, it's quite low. So Peru may be sort of um, increasing their amount of protected area, but it doesn't tend to cover key biodiversity areas that are determined by the global community. So if we look at this over um, the protected area coverage of KBAs, um, both the disaggregated global value and the national value, there's quite good agreement um, across all five countries. Uh, and so this is um, probably pointing to some of the effectiveness around national and world database on protected areas, that there's relatively good communication between those two data sets. But it does tell us which countries are the most off. So really in Peru and Colombia, we may want to look a little bit harder to understand 
you know, have we mapped the KBAs, have we mapped the protected areas? So this approach can, can help us refine data gaps, re refine data and, and identify, you know, where our efforts um, may need to be placed. So finally, the potential for carbon sequestration metric. We only have it for two countries and this is a demonstration of wildly different uh, results from globally disaggregated versus nationally reported values. So, and, and the results are um, different in each of these two countries in that for Colombia, the disaggregated global value states that there's much less potential for carbon sequestration than the Colombian national government is reporting. In Peru, it's the opposite. The government is reporting much less, half the, concert, the, the sequestration value than the globally disaggregated data set. This again points to the importance of us saying, you know, what is a forest? How are we measuring the potential for carbon sequestration? You know, if we if we want as a global community to be able to roll up national indicators or disaggregate global indicators, we have to make sure that our definitions and our methods can talk to one another. And so this is uh, a quick tool to be able to have that conversation with the people who are undertaking analyses like this. So finally, I want to quickly review a counterfactual assessment that Jimei Han undertook for uh, the state, for, for the country of Cambodia. A counterfactual analysis, are, these are things that are increasingly becoming important in the conservation community. Uh, it is a demonstration of the uh, establishing sort of metrics to be able to compare between an area in which conservation investment was made versus a more or less equivalent area where investment was not made, can we actually quantify what would have happened in the absence of the conservation investment and thereby prove the value of the investment that we have made? Uh, and so we undertook a conservation impact assessment of a particular region in Cambodia, the Eastern Plains, where we, um, we had conservation investment data from MacArthur and three other foundations that have a coordinated portfolio. And here the colored areas in the Eastern Plains region are the key biodiversity areas, which are the unit of conservation investment um, by this foundation consortium. So there are 45 KBAs in, in Cambodia all, all together. Um, and I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna pass over this first impact assessment that we undertook and move towards the just the one that we focused on in the Eastern Plains after we received some feedback from experts. So we wanted to have a high amount of a high sample size in being able to understand the impact of investment uh, so that we we could look at the range of investment across different um, spatial areas so we determined that watershed so we, were, we looked at 235 watersheds that cover the entire eastern plains. The red that you're seeing here is the forest loss, forest cover loss over that 10-year period. And we're looking at the KBAs and the amount of investment in those KBAs at the watershed scale out of those 235 watersheds in the eastern plains region. So the question that we wanted to ask is, have the watersheds within the KBAs that have received conservation investment, has there been a discernible difference in the rate of forest cover loss from 2000 to 2012 in those watersheds that have received investment versus those that have not? And that requires looking at a lot of other demographic and geographic and economic factors that could confound that analysis. It also requires geocoding the conservation investment. So uh, Jumet created a investment density per KBA and per watershed. Uh, and so we're looking at the dollars per square kilometer per watershed within each KBA that um, was the, essentially an investment density surface across these four different uh, coordinated uh, foundations that made these investments. And um, and so we uh, have this forest cover loss over this time. We have the investment density in each basin over time. And then we need to look at other explanatory variables. And you may look at 10 different variables from who manages the land to what's the population density um, to what, what is the extent of protection within these KBAs. 
uh, what kind of concessions to use that land in an extractive way have already been made. And of course, many of these are correlated with one another. So after analyzing for correlation, uh, we determined to move forward with four variables that together explained, that sort of avoided that the correlation issues uh, the most. And so conducted a analysis of the rate of forest loss in 117 watersheds that received no investment, in 59 watersheds that received an investment of one to seven hundred dollars per square kilometer, and another 59 watersheds that received an investment of seven to twenty-four hundred dollars. And if we look at the rate of forest loss over those three classifications, the statistical significance demonstrating a slowing of forest loss or a slow a lower rate of forest loss in the watersheds that received investment versus those that different that did not. The, the statistical significance is very high that the rate of forest loss was lower in those watersheds receiving investment and that the amount of investment was correlated with the rate at which forest loss was slowed. Uh, and so this is just a, a, a preliminary counterfactual analysis using just investment data from those four foundations. but. It had a pretty big impact when we presented this work to those foundations who had really never seen a counter, even a preliminary counterfactual like this conducted uh, for trying to understand how their investments were having a different difference, making a difference in the rate of forest loss. And it was facilitated by the information that we had in the dashboard. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank, thank Sarah very much for hosting us on the EBM Tools Network. The URL for the dashboard is here. It's up and live, and you can explore it on your own. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Jumei and I if you have any other uh, questions. And again, I just need to emphasize that the dashboard only exists because of the partnership that we have with many of the groups all around the world that are working on generating data that we have the opportunity to visualize and communicate through the Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard. So thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Hilly. Um, and everybody, I just want to repeat out and ask questions. You can type them into the question panel or raise your virtual hand, and I'll see it and can unmute you. So, um, Hilly, one of the questions that came in from a couple of folks is like, is anybody doing any work in this regard in the marine environment? So, I am unaware right now that there is any uh, sort of a marine biodiversity indicators dashboard. Uh, to the extent of our knowledge, this is the first sort of interactive, multi-scale uh, visualization tool for indicators uh, in, in the realm of biodiversity and conservation. Uh, I know that the MacArthur Foundation has supported uh, a consortium of organizations led by the Wildlife Conservation Society to undertake a, a very large coral reef monitoring project that includes uh, looking at communities that depend on those coral reefs. And there are several different efforts to um, find a way to sort of create indicators and, and aggregate them and sort of serve that marine community uh, and, be, and far beyond even just that one project that I just mentioned. So what tool is going to end up serving that data I think is uncertain right now. We certainly see a role for the dashboard and as I showed we would like to enter into the realm of being able to publish marine indicators. Uh, but we also recognize that um, there may be other efforts at foot and that one dashboard size may not fit all. Uh, and so we hope to play a role in, in the marine community. Right now there is no tool that we are aware of that, that does uh, a similar, you know, that provides similar interactive multi-scale visualization. Uh, and we look forward to seeing what happens in that space in the future and collaborating in any way that we can. Okay. Thank you, Haley. Um, another question that's come in from a couple of folks is, what is the, um, are there possibilities for downscaling this and using it at um, uh, smaller scales, like local scales, state scales? So it, that really depends on the indicator itself and to what is the appropriate spatial scale to which you can um, sort of extract information out of that indicator. So for example, the red, list, the, the red list index is not something that you can 
even that it's meaningless at the watershed scale. Or if we had something like the Living Planet Index, that can't be disaggregated to a national scale. So some indicators, such as forest cover loss, which are generated globally on a gridded fine spatial resolution, those certainly you could you could disaggregate them to very fine spatial scales. Other indicators, simply you can't ask the information to, to do that job at a fine scale. One of the reasons we're interested in focusing on national dashboards is because often there is much more information at finer spatial resolution uh, within a nation rather than in, on a continent or a global region. And so we're excited to, to move into that space. And we agree about the importance of having indicators at fine spatial scales, which is why we've generated um, the, the scale for protected areas or the scale of KVAs, it, it's why we've invested in um, watershed scale analysis for the indicators that can do that because it is really important to get to that finer spatial scale. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and, okay, let's see, uh, two, another question that's come in from a couple different sources. Um, is the underlying software that was used to create the dashboard, is it open source and publicly available? Uh, this is an ESRI platform. Uh, we've had NatureServe going all the way back to our uh, our origin as the science, the biodiversity information science division of the Nature Conservancy. We have a long-standing relationship with ESRI, and this is built on uh, as an ESRI web platform. Uh, Jimé, I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to add about uh, the platform, but the underlying um, technology, as I understand it, is based on, on ESRI software and therefore not open source. Right, right, I agree. So we, we use uh, R for some of the analysis, but our major platform is ESRI. Okay, <laughs> and um, look, is, is the, is the, is it something that could be ported over that someone else could use? themselves and, and do any modifications on? Jimé, I'm going to let you take that. Oh, yes, yes, we actually we plan to build the um, downloading function on the dashboard uh, in the next phase. So right now we, uh, there is no top button you can click and download the file yet, but in the next phase we will provide the downloading function for the shape file and the, uh, uh, like a tabular file. Okay. But that, so that is highly dependent on the governance of the data set itself. We are, you know, we're, we are not in the position to down, uh, offer download capacity for data sets that the originator of the data set um, doesn't support that. So um, we have to honor the, the originator of the data set and the, data, the agreement that they want um, as far as the ability of that data to, to be downloadable from the dashboard. Okay, and the analyses themselves, are those available? Like, any specifics? She may? Yes, 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 I think so. I think, like, as long as we have the, uh, we have the uh, right to, uh, to release, then they are available. We want people, as much as people, uh, as many as people to use the dashboard to do their work, yeah. We want to support the uh, um, community as much as possible. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and the contact information is there. Let's, uh, if you wanted, if anybody wanted to ask more questions, um, let's see. We have a couple others. We'll try and hit real quick. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, what's the best way for an NGO to be a data contributor? Give us a call or write a yeah, write write us and let us know. Um, what your data set is and uh, what geographic region it's applicable to. And we, I mean, certainly that is our, one of our greatest hopes is that we can provide the opportunity to visualize the data that you are producing. And because uh, we are hoping to go global and hoping to support all these different national portals, the opportunity to contribute data and then have a tool that you can readily show your audiences you know, clicking on and off your indicators. I mean, the dashboard will be successful when people are populating it with their indicator data and disseminating their indicators through this, this um, you know, through the tool that is offered by the dashboard. So please feel free to write Jume or I and let us know what indicator data you have and uh, 
under the assumption that we are refunded by MacArthur, we would have capacity to work with you to get your data into the dashboard. With, with pleasure. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and let's see, there's a question, are the socioeconomic benefit indicators that are being looked at, do, would they have any meaning for other interests such as poverty, disease, use, and non-use value? I think I'm trying relaying the question correctly. I mean, certainly, so right now we have, um, so we've got the, 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 there's an indicator that was generated by Conservation International that is the benefit of the flow of fresh water downstream to human populations. And so certainly being able to understand, you know, to what extent do downstream populations receive the benefit of the flow of fresh water as an ecosystem service. And there is a lot of relationship between, you know, either impoverishment or sometimes disease uh, related to limitations in the, the flow of fresh water to downstream populations. So it's a little bit of a leap there and you certainly would need to have enough local knowledge and sort of local context to be able to interpret that. Um, but there there is a connection to make there. Uh, for the carbon sequestration, maybe that's a little bit of a indirect indicator, but you could use it of poverty or well-being, but you could use it to advocate for keeping forests intact and of course human well-being of indigenous communities largely depends on the intactness of forests and so by being able to look quickly at well say which watershed or which country has the highest potential for sequestering carbon in their forests and then ask well what indigenous communities are dependent upon those forests so yes the links can be made but as I said, we're really looking for additional indicators of, of benefits as well. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you doing this, Healy and Shumei. Um, again, this was great, and uh, we're glad we were able to do it. Um, and I'll, I just encourage anyone, there were some questions we didn't get to. Uh, I'll provide those to the speakers, but um, for those of you who weren't able to ask your question, I will get in touch with them directly um, for, for more answers. Okay, well thank you guys so much, and, and thank you everyone for being here today, and we hope to have you on a future webinars. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to all who joined to learn about the dashboard today. Have a great afternoon. Okay, thank all right, you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.